Hi everyone. My name is Rachel Dixon. I am a massage therapist on Nantucket Island, currently working mostly online with posture. Um, I am a postural alignment specialist in addition to massage through Agosco University. And today we're going to be talking about how you can work with neck. So I think my internet's a little bad. Okay, hopefully it's going to be okay. Um, just to give a disclaimer, this is mostly for informational only. If for some reason it is not safe for you to do the exercises or anything that is uncomfortable, please do stop and talk to your doctor. You can also let me know if you have any questions. Um, so as much as I work with clients typically on the table, here, in a, here is an example of how what I'm going to teach today might be able to help. So about a year ago, I had a client who had come to me about three times for massage over a year and a half. So that's not frequently. I saw her about every six months. And on the third visit, she said to me, ever since I started coming to you for massage, my neck has felt better. Now I gotta tell you, it was not from the massage on the table that made a difference. It was the education I had given her about using her neck differently off the table and her applying it into her life that had made a really significant difference. So. There's three things that I commonly see when people come to me and they have pain in their neck. And I look at these different things, okay? Um, I find that people look down at their devices instead of using their eye muscles to look down. So that might look like this. Um, that they turn their neck instead of turning their body to look over their shoulder. And that they often connect with people by nodding frequently. And this is a really, really common thing that I see. Okay. So let me just tell you that if you have trouble with turning your neck but working your body as a unit, um, it's in your pamphlet, but you could work on rolling patterns or rotating using the hip. And, and if you can put people by nodding your head like this, there are ways that you can work on learning to connect just nodding. Becoming aware that you just move your neck or that you nod with people is a great place to start. But today we're not really going to focus on those two things. So today's focus is going to be on eye movement for better device usage, as well as a posture menu to improve your head and neck alignment. Now, what's interesting is because the body works as a unit by improving some of our posture and how we use our neck, it will help more than just our neck, okay? But how many people see postures that look like this when it comes to devices? So really commonly, I'm just trying to make sure everyone can see me. If you're looking down at your phone, you see sort of this, okay? If you're working on a computer, you often see this jutting of the neck. Or if you're on a laptop, you're going to see people sort of leaning over like this. This is what my teenager does. And then it's really common for kids on gaming devices to be focused like this. So anyway, anyone recognize any of those clusters? Really, really common. So. Um, here is how you do eye exercises. Now, eye exercises come in because people get irritated necks because we're overusing our neck instead of using our eye muscles to do the work. So eye muscles are extremely important with our balance system. They're tied in with our vestibular system. And as you age, it's really important to keep your vestibular system healthy. Our vestibular system is going to be our eye placement and how we use our eyes. It's going to be uh, related to our ear crystals and if our ear crystals are in the correct place, but I'm not gonna address that today. And it's gonna be tied into the health of the nerves at the bottom of the feet. But balance is incredibly important. So these eye exercises are going to help both with not over irritating our neck and they're gonna potentially keep you healthier for your, oh, your whole vestibular system. 
So here's how you can use eye exercises. First of all, eyes are always meant to be horizontal in space. Sometimes you see people that tilt their head a little bit and they might have their head like this. So this would be eyes not horizontal. This would be horizontal, okay? And sometimes too, they might have an element where your head is like this. So now my eyes are sort of horizontal, but they're not equal in space like this. So in theory, our eyes are meant to be horizontal. And then we have muscles in our eyes and our muscles are supposed to work. So if we had our phone here, we're supposed to roll our eyes down to look at our phone as opposed to too much of looking down like this. So how we can get our eye muscles to start working is working with um, it's just moving them. So we keep our eyes horizontally in space. And now I'm going to focus on, say, a wall in front of me. And I'm going to make a big imaginary cross on it or an X. It doesn't really matter. And while keeping my eyes horizontal in space, so I'm not going to be moving my head at all, I'm going to be rolling my eyes up to look at the top of the cross. And then I'm going to come back and pause in the middle. And then I'm going to roll my eyes down to look at the bottom of the cross. And I'm going to come to the center and pause. And then I'm going to look left and come to the center and right to the center. One other thing that you can do while keeping your eyes horizontal in space is just making big circles. And really, as much as possible, you want to be um, not only moving your eyes, but you should feel that they're moving. So you should be focusing on, on um, focus. Sorry. You should make sure that you're focusing along the way. It's not just about whipping through the eye motions. It's about keeping the head horizontal, getting the eyes to move, and to focus along the way. Another exercise that's not going to help as much with this, but it's very good for overall eye health, is to focus on something relatively near, like your finger, which is only a couple feet away. So I'm going to focus on my hand or my finger for a second. And then if I'm outside, I'm going to focus on that tree that's maybe 50 to 100 yards away. And I'm going to focus on that for a few seconds. And then I'm going to focus here on my finger. And then I'm going to focus on the tree. And the focusing system is going to be very helpful, but learning how to use your eyes instead of overusing your neck is going to be really, really useful. Our body is meant to be used and to use frequently, but it's, it's meant to have your eyes move first. And if you have your eyes move first, you aren't going to have some of those poor postures that everyone sees. Anyone have any questions before I move for, forward? Okay, well, if you get questions, just let me know. Okay, so here is how we can improve our posture while working on those devices. So if we're now used to being able to keep our eyes relatively horizontal in space, okay, if we're working on our phone, instead of bringing our head down to look at our phone, we might be able to relatively keep our head horizontal, roll our eyes down to look at our phone, okay, and then bring our phone up somewhere where we can find that comfortable spot where we can still see the device that we're looking at without overusing our neck. If you're sitting at the computer, uh, the class that I did last week about how to set up your computer is going to be helpful. Some of it's going to be maintaining that the screen is going to allow your eyes to be relatively horizontal, most of your body to be in relative right angles of each other, and um, that we're sort of facing forward as opposed to twisting to one side or the other. For teens using a laptop, this is always tricky, but it's to just prop up as much as possible for them to be able to sit up and prop up their screen so that they're relatively able to, to be able to keep your eyes horizontal in space when you're working on it. And with gaming devices with the kids, because they tend to have such, such flex backs when they work on it, if they were to get on the ground in more of a cobra position, let me see if I can, okay. So if kids were to get on the ground in more of a cobra position, 
while they worked on their devices, then they're going to have a neutral neck and they're going to have a slight extension in their back and not such a flexed body as they used to have. All right. Anyone have any questions initially on the eye exercises or ways of adjusting your computer before we get into the posture? Okay. It will make a massive difference if you start adding this into your life. All right. So the posture exercises that I'm going to demonstrate today, there's really three of them. And they're going to be helping overall help your neck align better over your body so that your head is able to maintain that horizontal space better. Okay. So I'm going to demonstrate them. And if you have any questions, let me know. Um, the first one is static extension position. The second one is the Agassiz kneeling ankle squeezes. And the third one is the Agassiz frog pullover. Um, so let me go start those. Just want to make sure you can see me. There we go. All right. Okay. So with the static extension position, we're really going to start on all fours with our elbows locked and our knees at right angles. And we're going to start with sort of right over our shoulders, right over our hips. But then I'm going to move my hands forward about six inches. And now I'm going to shift my hips forward. And now I'm straight over my elbows, but I'm at a slight angle with my hips. And now I'm going to roll my hips forward so I have a curve in my low back. I'm going to sink between my shoulder blades, and now I have a relatively extended back, and I'm going to let my head come forward. So now my head is flexed, but the rest of my body is relatively extended, and I'm going to be here for about a minute. So this is the static extension position. If it is, you will find that your upper body is working more initially, but it's going to shift the work into the back. But it's going to allow extension in the entire back with flexion at the hips. All right, so the squeezes, I'm going to get a block. And this block is just going to allow my upper body to be in proper alignment. So now I'm sort of asking my hips to do a little bit of work. I'm going to get sort of an, a pillow, and I'm going to be putting them between my ankles. And now as I'm just sitting here, I'm going to squeeze for two seconds and release, and squeeze for two seconds between the pillow. And the work that it's doing is going to be up here in the hips. And so now that my body is in a lined position, I'm going to squeeze and release at the pillow. And this is going to ask my hips to do some of the work that I tend to do in my neck. And to create a stable base for that neck. Okay. The last exercise that I'm going to go over for today is a frog. A frog pullover. So with the frog pullovers, I'm going to come here. My feet are going to be together. I'm going to lie on my back. And okay, so I'm going to lie on my back. My lower back is going to curve up. That's okay. We want to allow that back to have some space. And so it's going to ask my hips to open. My back is just going to relax here. I'm not going to force it onto the ground, but I'm going to lock my hands together and you're going to go down as comfortable as you can to the ground and come back and forth. So now it's asking for space in my low back. Well, I'm getting some movement of the scapula and the upper back. Now, if you found that you only went to here and then your back was arching further because of that space, 
then you would only go down as far as you could comfortably maintain the normal arch that you already have. So if I was arching far more, I would only go down as far as the normal arch in your back would allow until you gain more space. With doing this more frequently, you would actually have more time to do things. All right. We actually went through all those a lot more quickly than I expected. So does anyone have any, any questions about anything? If you want, I could even go over some additional um, balance and vestibular um, things if people were interested. All right, well, if we have time, Lee, do you have a question? No? Okay. 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 So because we have a couple of minutes, let me show you one or two other exercises that might perhaps help. Um, so the vestibular system is balanced. It's going to take the eyes in horizontal. So in creating those healthier muscles are going to be very helpful. The crystals in place there's not a heck of a lot you can do about the crystals not being in the right place. There are self-help things. It is tricky. But maintaining the proper alignment of your head over your shoulders is going to make a big difference. A lot of times when people have a very rounded forward head like this, um, they will tend to have more issues with vertigo and things like that. Um, the la uh, another thing that you can work on with your vestibular system is the health and the nerves of the bottom of the feet. And those are the ones that are um, going to kick in for balance. So you have more of the motor nerves of your body, and that's going to be the big one that moves the muscles. The peripheral nerves, the little tiny guys, you have some in your hands, but you have more of them in the bottom of the feet. And they're the ones that tell the motor nerves what to do. And they're the ones that give the signal to the brain of where you are in space. So for example, if you are starting to fall over to one side, your peripheral nerves send the message very quick to the brain that says, whoa, something's wrong. I'm not where I'm supposed to be. And then the signal goes to the motor nerves to, you know, to sort of um, capture where you are and sort of right yourself. So the health of your peripheral nerves are going to be related somewhat to how healthy your circulation is, how healthy your nerves are. So both of those might be compromised somewhat as you get older or as if you have something like diabetes or something that's going to decreased circulation. Neuropathy is also a problem. It's, it's unhealthy nerves that aren't getting quite as much um, circulation as they're supposed to be. But here's the kicker. It also is related to your ability to wiggle your toes and to move your toes separate from your ankle. With most people in the shoes that we wear nowadays, the shoes are really quite a solid block. I don't have shoes in front of me, but they're a really solid block, okay? And we tend to move our ankle and our whole foot moves like this, but a lot of times what we really need is for our toes to be able to wiggle like this and our toes to be able to work separate from our whole ankle joint. So what everyone can do to improve your vestibular system is to get your toes to work better. And I will just show you a few things that you could do. And perhaps if people are interested, the next class could be a very basic foot class if you're interested. But I'm going to go bring the camera over to, um, to my map so you can see my feet better. OK. So OK. So in the ideal world, OK, let's see. So in the ideal world, okay, your feet would be able to spread apart as well as come together. You'd be able to lift up your toes, and you would be able to perhaps lift up your big toe separate from your little guys, 
and your little guys separately from your big guys. So your ability to move all these guys separately is going to be able to help um, get your peripheral nerves to be healthier. Because it's also related to um, circulation, very often sort of massaging the bottom of the foot. So, um, but they originate in the feet. Um, that can be Rachel. Yep. We lost you after massaging the bottom of the foot. Okay. So, so, so depending on if your foot has a stability issue, um, which is too weak, um, in getting the muscles to work, specifically the muscles in the toes, though there are some muscles in the low leg as well that originate in the feet, can be very helpful. And with people that have too rigid a foot, their foot is kind of stuck. Um, mobility things, which are both getting your foot to move more, and that could be, um, that might look like, you know, this and this, or using different balls to release the tissue or to get the tissue to move differently, like, like for the foot, if you were to move different things like this, it can be very helpful. Um, and then putting it all together, training that foot that's responding better into the motor nerves, um, asking it to, um, to work together. So that might be that you start to have a really stable foot that's now responding better to things. And then I'm going to ask to stand, um, to, to, uh, to balance on top of it. So I would have, you're not going to see my foot so much, but work that's being done in the bottom of my foot. And then I'm going to balance on one leg and I'm going to challenge it in various different ways. All right. Hey, Rachel, I'm sorry. Can sorry. you do that again? Yeah. Your image was frozen while you were doing Oh, sorry. I don't have the best of internet. Sure. So you're not going to see the bottom of my feet, okay? But I'm going to just spread my toes apart and push my feet into the ground. And now I'm going to be asking my body to balance on that one leg. So now I'm challenging it in a couple of different ways while I'm on um, a balanced thing. Another way that's probably safer for people um, if they're new to it is to just go up on your toes with my toes pointing forward. So you can always hold on to a chair too, okay? But now my feet are hip width apart. I'm going up on my toes. Then I'm going to change the position and I'm going to go up on my toes. Now I'm going to change to pigeon toed, and this is the one that people actually typically have the most trouble with. And then we're going to go up on your toes in this position. And now I'm asking my body, I'm sort of tying in the bottom of my feet with my hips. But there's a lot more I can teach about feet and vestibular system, so um, we could perhaps do that in another class. Anyway, does anyone have any questions about the eyes or the horizontal system or any of the exercises that we did today? One pattern that you will often see is, I might have one particular focus of the day, but it's most likely going to help all sorts of different parts of your body because your body is tied together as a unit. But any questions that I can answer for today? I have one. Okay. So when you do the ex you showed us one where the legs were um, against the wall and you did the almost like the chop yeah. or whatever. For the, mm -hmm. And then today you showed us with the frog leg and mm -hmm. doing basically the same thing. It mm -hmm. is, should you be doing both or is one, one better than the other? Um, 
So I guess that's the question. They're, they're different. They're different. Okay. So when it comes to the shoulder, it didn't make a big difference. Okay. The static wall, where it was up against the wall, okay, is if you had, that would be an excellent one to do also, okay? That is going to um, put more pressure. So if you had a really rounded upper back right here, the static wall one is probably gonna be better for you than the frog one, okay? If you had tight hip flexors, um, which are the muscles, um, so the muscles that are right in here, okay, if you were to, um, if you were to lie on your back, um, let's see, the frog, the frog is going to be good for someone who actually has a very flat back. So, but the people with a very flat back have to be a little bit careful because your back is already really straight and there's supposed to be a little bit of a curve there, but sometimes people have arthritis in that back. So a similar arthritis that you would see in a really flat back would be a stenosis um, and a few other things. But your body is meant to have those curves. And if you can introduce those curves back into your body, it would be really good for you. Um, you would also commonly see if someone <laughs> had a very C curve back. So in other words, your pelvis is tipped like this, and then your whole body is in a C. Then the frog would be a great way. You will typically have a flat low back instead of a really curved low back. And um, the frog would be good for you as long as it didn't irritate the back. Sometimes those really solidly arthritic backs will get, they need that um, curve in the back, but you have to kind of go very slowly into it um, because it, it can irritate it a little bit. So if you had a really C curve back or you had a really flat low back, the frog would be better for you because they're go that's going to be introducing the curve into the low back whereas the static wall one isn't. That one's gonna be pushing on that upper back more to try to flatten out the upper back. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Excellent. All right, any other questions? I just had a quick one. Um, <clears throat> can you review the reasons for the eye exercises? Is it to make the muscles in your eyes stronger? so that when you're looking down, using your eyes to look down instead of your neck. Um, could so, you just read that? Okay, so the using your eye muscles is part of your overall nervous system. It is meant Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we lost you there for a minute. I know, okay, sorry. So we're gonna tap into our nervous system. When you look at the levels of what's supposed to move first in your body, everything related to your nervous system is supposed to work first. So every movement that we do, whether it's looking over our shoulders, it's looking up or it's looking down, the eyes are supposed to move first and the body is going to follow, okay? So in theory, if we just look down at our neck, okay, we're cutting out our entire nervous system, but we're also overworking our muscles and we're not benefiting our body at all. So, we're, so by just looking down right here, we're bypassing a regular loose use of All right, all right, let me know. Okay, you can hear me now. Okay, so our eyes are always, when you look at the rules of our nervous system, our eyes are always supposed to move first. 
So if we are only using our head to look down, not only are we overusing a joint in a way that it's not healthy for us, we are not tapping into our nervous system, which rules the roost. It's supposed to go first, okay? So it's not just in looking down at our screens that our eyes are supposed to move first and our heads a little bit. It's everything. It's looking over our shoulders. Our eyes are supposed to move first and our body's going to follow. It's looking down. Eyes are going first. Body is supposed to follow. There is also the rule that your body will follow your eyes. And a very common thing that you see, perhaps with walking, okay, is that people are looking down on the ground because they're afraid to fall, right? And if your body is going to follow your eyes, you're more likely to fall if you constantly are looking down at the ground. And this is also very common with older people. As you become less steady and less feeling where you are in space, you're more likely to look down. So um, it's more healthy for you to find that balance between how much do I need to look down and how much can I feel on the ground and how much can I keep my head horizontal in space and look down at the ground to see what's on the ground while keeping my body upright, which is going to make me less likely to trip and fall and land on the ground. So it's really about training the nervous system, but it's gonna go very, very much hand in hand with overall a healthy nervous system and maintaining um, health and stability as you age, which a lot of people don't realize how poor their nervous system is working until it's never too late, but it gets harder when you've lost some stuff. So, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. All right, well, that is pretty much what I have for today. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me and we can go from there.